how life would be. I just ran into a classmate from Bible College, graduated with a, 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 a gal. She was from Lima, Ohio, going through the line for food, and I looked at her. I said, did you go to Baptist Bible College? She said, are you Duke? I said, are you Teresa? It's like, whoa. <laughs> and I, my mind went back to when we were just kids and we surrendered to Jesus, went to Bible school, had no clue was await, what was awaiting us. And I'll confess to you, I worried about a few things. <laughs> How am I going to pay my bills? My father um, handed me $1,000 uh, the day before I was leaving for Bible school, but he was in the liquor business, and I, I didn't want to take liquor money to go to Bible college. <laughs> so I, I said, Dad, I love you. I know you love me. This means the world to me, but I, I, I just feel that it's not your responsibility to pay my way through. It's my Heavenly Father's responsibility. My Heavenly Father who seeth in secret will reward me open. And he was, a little, he was a little offended, but he took it back. But when it was all said and done, I graduated debt-free. He put his arm around me and said, I'm proud of you, Sonny. And um, he wasn't saved. He got saved at age 68. And um, I got to baptize him. He's in heaven. Wait till you meet him. There's other weird people in heaven. <laughs> and um, I just think of some of the anxieties that... I had to, you know, kind of find a woman. <laughs> Lord, help me! You know, I, I found out beautiful women will marry ugly men if we get close enough to Jesus. That's good preaching, ain't it? Maybe we should just give an invitation right now. But I think of a lot of the anxiety that I had along the way. So unnecessary. Were the disciples scared in the boat in the middle of the sea? And Jesus was and they were scared when he was with them. They were scared, weren't they? Was their fear real? Absolutely. Here's a better question. Was it legitimate? I'd say no. I'd say he has the whole world. And in his Amen. I think our fears are legitimate. So I want you to think as we're going to launch in tonight's Bible study. It's going to be more of a Bible study tonight, uh, as, as you'll see. I'm blending two messages together, the rise of the Antichrist and what I call the alignment of the nations, easty, westy, northy, southy. It'll all fit together. But I just think of the disciples, their fear was real, but it was so illegitimate. And I look at my life and a lot of the fears I had, and I look back, you know what I say? Same thing. Joshua said, his record is perfect. Everything he promised, he did. Yeah. No, so here we are facing kind of a, <laughs> the world's a bit in crisis, have you noticed? And if our eyes are not on him, this world would give us reason to be, have some anxieties. But you know what? I think we can swing out over hell on a rotten corn stock and sing Amazing Grace. He's got it. And I'm so glad he told us the end from the beginning so we can watch and understand what's happening. I'm going to go back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 9, and we're, we're, we're talking about the alignment of the nations, and we, we're going to see a prophecy that God gave way up front, Genesis chapter 9, right after the, the, the flood of Noah and the, a prophecy of the descendants of Noah, and it's going to fit perfect into the end day scenario, another coinky dink, or God's providence. Somebody asked me the other night how to spell coinky dink. I just made something up, I don't know. I was taught in Bible school when you can't pronounce a word, a Hebrew name or something, just pronounce it with authority and nobody will know the difference. <laughs> um, Genesis 9, this is God looking way down through the corridor of time. And we're just going to kind of march through that tonight. We're going to end up where this says it will end up. Uh, after the flood, uh, Noah's uh, son Canaan kind of went in uh, the wrong place at the wrong time and uncovered his father's nakedness is how the Bible would put it. 
And it says in Genesis 9, 25, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant, a servant shall uh, be unto his brethren. So you, uh, and said, Blessed be the Lord of Shem, and, Ca uh, and Canaan shall uh, be his servant. So you have Shem, uh, Shem Ham, and Japheth, and Canaan and, and Ham, it's, it's, it's the same guy. And God shall enlarge Japheth. That's going to be very important. Uh, in, in, it's just, I just want to show you that here's the beginning. He said, here's the end. And guess what? He wasn't kidding. And the more I understand the scriptures, the more peace I have. The more I understand the scriptures, the more that a fire burns inside of me. People come up and say, oh, you know, the Bible was written by man. <laughs> you want to talk? You want to back that up? I'll talk to you. I, I, it just to, to know the scriptures, to have a biblical worldview, takes away this unnecessary fear. And so the prophecy is that, uh, sh that Japheth will uh, be enlarged. Japheth. And as you study the descendants of Shem, uh, excuse me, of Noah, Japheth went to the west. Shem stayed in the Middle East and, and migrated east. So their descendants were kind of there off to the east. And the descendants of Ham migrated to the south. And over the period of many generations, the genetic isolation of gene pools brought forth what we would call the races. There's just one race. The human race, our bloodlines are all interchangeable and in genetics, but that's where the racial features came from. But God prophesied that Japheth would be the stronger one, okay? Just the Bible just sort of fits together. We'll see. So now we're going to look at the end time scenario. I hit this uh, the other night in. Daniel chapter 2, just a, like a, a 60 second review. Then we're going to go to chapter 7, which kind of says the same thing, but we're going to kind of zoom in on the end times event. And we're going to look at the alignment of the nations. We're going to fit it all together. And then when you turn on the news, even the fake news gets some things right. And we'll see this absolute biblical alignment of the nations. Genesis was written a long time ago uh, by Moses at the time of the Exodus. Uh, but God called the end from the beginning. So in Daniel chapter 2, just a, uh, just a survey, Nebuchadnezzar has the dream, giant statue, head, and, he, and, and God gave the interpretation of it. I'm, I'm covering a lot of ground, so I, I know some of you that are newbies are like, oh, you're going too fast. It's like getting a drink out of a water uh, hydrant, you know. <laughs> some of you that have been students of the scriptures, you, you, you know well the prophecy of Daniel. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, head of gold, Babylon, chest of silver, Medo-Persian empire, loins of brass, Grecian empire, legs, legs of iron, Roman empire, feet, Iron mingled with clay, Rome phase two. And I believe Rome phase two is the European community which convened uh, March 2nd, 1957. Right after World War II, Europe comes together to form what is the European Union today. And other nations have been brought into that. We call that a large group, NATO. And that's gonna fit with Ezekiel 38. We're gonna be there in just a, a couple minutes. And it's like, you saying God had this all figured out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. And he wants us to be comforted by this. Yeah. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. Free from unnecessary fear. Uh, free from the fear of man. You know, somebody wants to come along and challenge me in creation science. Let's go. Let's go to the laboratory. Let's go to the, uh, let's, you know, let's go to the field. Let's go dig up the rocks. Rocks don't lie. And so... God wants us to be secure, not driven about by every wind of doctrine. So when people speak to us, they can see that we have peace. We're facing the same world, but we're not facing it without hope. We know what's happening. We know why it's happening. We know where it's going. And we win. And so I think one of the greatest things to win people to Christ during this upcoming <laughs> month, year, or how much time we have till Jesus comes is just walking with him. Just being plugged into church. You know, I... Man, we're in church tonight. Isn't it great? 
To be in church. I remember when church wasn't part of my life. I was at the party. It wasn't very safe. It's just so good to be a church person. The assembly of the followers of Jesus. So we get to, t- uh, and then we see in Daniel 2, as you have the transcending of time, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome, phase 1, Rome, phase 2, the focus comes on Rome, phase 2, and then there is a visitor to the planet. He's called uh, in Daniel 1 place, the uh, Ancient of Days. But I want us to look at Daniel 2, verse uh, 35. Then was the iron, uh, see the Rome phase 2, the iron and clay. You see the, the old Roman Empire was together. The revived Roman Empire, there's a lot of diversity in the European <laughs> thinking. And so it's iron kind of mingled with clay and they don't have that unity and the strength that they had in the first phase of the Roman Empire. And so now it's the time of the end and it's the great world uh, global uh, power Verse 35, then was the iron and the clay and the brass and silver and gold broken in pieces. Somebody's going to tear it up. <laughs> We're going to see who. And uh, we kind of love this guy. His name's, his name's Jesus. He came the first time as the Lamb of God. He comes the second time as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, the prophet Isaiah said. So it's going to be broken, became like chaff of the summer threshing floors. He's not going to break a sweat when he wipes out this final kingdom. This will be the kingdom of the Antichrist. That's how you teach people. You tell them what you're going to tell them. We're going to show you this is the Antichrist. Then you show them. Then you show them what you, to- what you showed them. Amen. Uh, and the wind carried them away. No peace was, uh, place was found for them. And the stone, Jesus is the rock of my salvation, And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof. And he talks about the different kings that rise and fall. And he uh, focuses in on that fourth kingdom and its destruction by one who comes to tear it up and set up his kingdom. The model prayer Jesus gave us, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. That's going to happen, and it's never been as close as it is today. Jump over to chapter 7 for a moment. It's kind of the same thing. You know, when God says something once, it's, uh, that's real important. That's going to happen. But when he says the same thing twice, I think he's trying to drive it home, drive home the thing, the point. Uh, so D- uh, Daniel has a dream of four beasts that rise up. The winged lion, which historically is the emblem uh, of the Babylonian Empire. Then the bear, which was the Medo-Persian Empire. Then the uh, leopard, which was Alexander the Great. Leopards are very swift. Alexander the Great swiftly, by age 30, he wept. He had no more nations to conquer. He died, his kingdom was divided, and they fought over it, and it fell apart. So uh, then his attention comes to the fourth beast, and uh, a lot of detail is given on that fourth kingdom. There was that early phase of the fourth kingdom, Rome, and then the second phase of the fourth kingdom, Roman uh, Empire coming back together. In Daniel, uh, it talked about that nation having ten toes, that that, uh, statue. In uh, Daniel's vision, he talks about this kingdom having ten horns. Ten toes, chapter 2, ten horns, uh, just kind of saying the same thing in a little bit different light. And in verse 8, Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, it considered the horns, the different nations uh, uh, of the European uh, revived Roman Empire. Behold, there came up among them another little horn. I believe that's one of the many titles of the Antichrist. Before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And how I would interpret that is probably uh, three of the greater nations of the European Union would get together and say, hey, this is our man And uh, it just solidifies. Instead of looking to the three stronger nations, those three stronger nations say, this is our man. That's how I see uh, that. And that, you know, you have what the Word of God says, that's a lock. You have what a preacher like me or others, how we interpret it, that's 
that may not be exactly right. That's just how I interpret it. But we know <laughs> that the nations are coming together. That's, that's clear in Scripture. This part would be an interpretation. And I'll share you, with you as we go the difference between, here's what the Scriptures say, and there are good men who disagree uh, on some of these things. Uh, I'm a great fan of Dr. Jer David Jeremiah. I listen to him a lot, and uh, he agrees with me on a whole lot of stuff. So, <laughs> Or maybe it would be better to say I agree with him. You know, I think he's a little smarter than I am. And God is using him in his 80s like he's never used. So some of you think you're getting off the hook just because you're getting old. God ain't done with you yet. Just hang in there. Um, and uh, behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and the mouth speaking great things. Daniel 9 is going to talk about the de ab uh, what was it? abomination of desolation. A man's mouth speaking great things. We put scripture with scripture. Then we're going to jump ahead in a little bit in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I think I know exactly what he says. This guy sits in the temple of God claiming to be God. I think that's the abomination of desolation and his mouth speaking great things. So that's an interpretation, but I'm real confident in that one, okay? Uh, verse 9, and I beheld till, he's in power now, till, <laughs> Woo! I love that transition. He's not in power long. It takes him three and a half years to come from prominence to power. We're in the middle of the tribulation. At the, and then he's in power, institutes the mark of the beast, till now we're at the end of the tribulation. We're going to fit a whole bunch of important things, little thing called like Armageddon. We're going to fit that in. You know, we think about the war of Armageddon. A lot of people think it's just, you know, one big battle. Shoot, boom, done. Actually, I'm going to show you three battles. And the third will be, boom, done. But there's going to be two that lead up to it. We're going to see how those initial battles in Armageddon uh, kind of frame the thinking of the world and see how this all fits. So we have the Antichrist arising out of the revived Roman Empire, and he's going to get, he's going to, <laughs> he, the stone wipes him out in chapter 2, and in chapter uh, uh, 7, verse uh, nine, and I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And who? The Ancient of Days, capital A, before Abraham was, I am. It's Jesus. And the Ancient of Days did sit with whose garment was white as snow. You can overlay this description of the Ancient of Days, Jesus with the glorified Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. It's the same guy, uh, as white as snow, his hair is, uh, his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. He's going to be a little baby in a manger. Thank God for that baby in a manger. Amen. Amen. But he's coming back to kick butt and take names, they'd say, in New York. The Ancient of Days. And so we could uh, look over till. Uh, Verse 21, Genesis 7, 21, and Behold, the same horn made war with the saints. Antichrist does not like God people. He's going to make war with the saints. Well, I thought the saints were raptured out at the beginning of the tribulation. I believe they are. I'm going to show you why in a minute. But after we have the rapture of the church, it's time out for the church. We go home, and it's time in. For Israel, we're going to see that in a minute. And we have one week left on their clock, the Great Tribulation. And in the, um, I just lost my train of thought here. I shouldn't have gone to Woodstock in 1969. There would be, there's consequences for that. And so, the, oh yeah, the, he makes war with the saints. After the rapture of the church, you get in Revelation chapter 7, you see 144,000, who preacher? Jews. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. It becomes a Jewish book again. God's got to settle his, uh, his deal with the Abrahamic covenant. I'll bless those who bless the Jew. I'll curse those who curse the Jew. And so these Jewish witnesses are going all over the world preaching the gospel, just like the church, 
That's our job to do that now. And many will be coming to faith. And what's the Antichrist going to do with those guys? He's coming after them. And those will probably be a lot of the people who refuse to take the mark of the beast. Okay? So you just put scripture with scripture and, and the scenario begins to unfold, what we can expect. I was taught this premillennial, pre-tribulation uh, position in eschatology, study of future events, when I was in Bible college. And I've, I, I didn't just accept it because I love my professors. I've, I've studied it and <laughs> For years, and the more I study it, the more I think I was taught right in the beginning. And uh, everything fits, and I think you'll see that. So, his mouth speaks great things, and he makes war with the saints. And uh, we see in verse 22, until <laughs> he's doing his thing, he's making war against the saints. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And he said, he focuses more on that fourth beast, Rome phase two, uh, shall be forth a kingdom upon earth and shall be different from all the other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of his kingdom are the ten kings. Go back to the ancient Roman Empire. There were ten uh, territories, ten provinces, and that's exactly what it's talking about here. Now, just to kind of put together the scenario, throughout history, remember Japheth, the western, northeast, south, easty, westy? Japheth is westy. He's going to be the dominant one. Remember who saw that? Genesis 9. And so, the Roman Empire revived is westy. It's going to be the dominant one. It's not going to be a good one, but it's a dominant one. And we're going to see that America and the new world order that our president just three weeks ago said, we're going to lead the way. We, need, we must lead the way in the new world order. That's westy. America will be part of westy. We're going to see the other opponents. And now I'm going to show you in Daniel 9, the reason for a lot of the opposition. Here we go, Daniel chapter 9. God had given the rise and fall of the kingdoms, and now you, Daniel's writing during the time of the Babylonian Empire. They're in occupied territory. He's up in Babylon. They're captive. The city is controlled by the Babylonians, and the Jews are like, what up with us? Are we, you know, what's up with us? Well, Jeremiah told them, you guys, 70 years. <laughs> and that happened to the letter, and Daniel brought that to their attention. But they're saying, what about us? What's going to happen to us? So that's what the whole ninth chapter of Daniel is about. Daniel is to the Old Testament what the book of Revelation is to the New Testament. It's a full prophetic book. So we get in Daniel chapter 9, and we'll pick up in verse 24. And I've, I had to go through this three times in Bible college. The first time the, pastor taught, the professor taught, I'm like, Okay, <laughs> and I didn't got it. I know that's bad English, but I'm from New York. That's the way we talk. Um, and so he went through it again, and uh, I sort of st still didn't got it. And then I went through it the third time, and it's like, aha. Many of you already had that aha moment to see this. Some of you might have it, and I might leave some of you in the dust. Or say, uh, what did he say? Here we go. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. When the Bible talks about thy people, what people group is that talking about? the Jews, Israel, the Jewish people, and upon thy people, upon thy holy city, what would that be? Jerusalem. And put 70 weeks on your clock. 70. Boom. How many days a week? Seven. So seven, seven weeks would be, times seven would be 490 uh, days. Just, just keep that in mind. This is on the Jewish clock. The church wasn't even around yet, okay? 70 weeks upon the, 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 the clock. Watch the Jewish people, your holy city. And when those 70 weeks are up, these six things he's going to name now will have transpired. None of these six things have transpired yet. But they're going to be soon. 
He names them. Number one, uh, to finish transgressions. Number two, to make an end of sins. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. And I wish I could develop each one of these, but number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up the vision and prophecy. And number six, the biggest one of all, to anoint the most holy. Guess who that is? Jesus. That hadn't happened yet. But that's going to happen, just as sure as your name is your name. And they're like, okay, 70 weeks and on our clock, and when do we stop the clock? And we know a Messiah is coming. Is, he's got to be part of the deal. So they, he's going to give them more information. He's going to explain it. Verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Aha, that's good news. We're going to rebuild the city. That's great. Nebuchadnezzar tore it down. We're going to build it up. That's great. So they like that. that but he said that's the starting point. When that decree comes, it's just, uh, it's going to be a few years later. Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Babylon falls to Persia. Persia uh, has a sensitivity. Uh, they take Daniel to be, their, uh, to be one of their, like their prime minister to, to lead their way. And this stuff actually happens. And so um, the, Artaxerxes, king of Persia, signed a decree for the Jews to go back under uh, uh, Nehemiah to rebuild the walls. And he said, I'll pay for it. That's cool. That happened. The Jews are happy. The clock has started. Tick, 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 tick. And we're going to see that every day, it wasn't 490. Or, well, let me divide it up. The way God divided it up. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Aha! 445 B.C. Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Nehemiah goes back, rebuilds the walls until uh, shall go forth the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto who? Messiah. Jesus is coming. He is in this picture. He's central to this picture. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jerusalem. Now, you would think if the western, easty, westy, northy, southy battle alignment of the nations in the end, if you think they're going to have a capital... The last place in the world you want to have your capital is Jerusalem. There's not even an airport in town. You've got to come into Tel Aviv. There's no port. There's no rail. you just got one highway. Jerusalem is not a convenient place. But you see, Satan hates God. And if Jerusalem is God's capital, Satan's going to set up his capital in Jerusalem. It makes no political sense. It makes spiritual sense because the evil one wants to rub it in God's face. And God's going to allow this to happen <laughs> till the ancient of days comes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah, do your thing, Satan, and uh, you'll be sorry. Uh, to build Jerusalem to Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, that's seven, and three score and two, that's 69 weeks. So that would be 483 days. But Jesus did not appear 483 days. Days later, every year, every day represented a year. God had done that. Israel had 40 days of opportunity in checking out the promised land under Moses. And they blew it. And they wandered in the wilderness for how long? 40 years. A day for a year. There's 10 places in the Bible. This is just another one of those. A day for a year. So let's go with that formula. We're not going to roll forward 483 days. We're going to roll forward 483 years. And guess who's coming down the crooked street, down the Mount of Olives, into the east, through the eastern gate of the Holy City on Palm Sunday? The Ancient of Days. <laughs> Phase one, the Lamb of God. The Messiah has come. That prophecy was fulfilled to the letter. The Messiah came. And they thought he was coming to kick the Romans out of town. We're going to find out he's coming the first time to be the Lamb of God. He's coming the second time. Not to drive the Romans out of town, maybe the revived Romans, but to destroy the little horn, to destroy the wicked one, to destroy the son of perdition, to uh, destroy the Antichrist. 
See, what happens is Scripture starts fitting together with Scripture, with Scripture. God could have done it in more simpler fashion. But he chose to do it this way, where you got to think and study and pray and develop the model. Does this fit? What about this? And as we do this, I think it honors the Lord because he sees our heart. He said, blessed are those who love his appearing. You can't be messing around with sin and love his appearing. (laughs) You don't want him to come and catch you doing your bad stuff. And so when we try to rightly divide the word of God and ask him to guide us and give us wisdom, his spirit moves upon us. And I think just that spirit, just being here tonight for a, a Bible prophecy conference, most churches don't even mess with it. Well, because people are divided over it. And what if I get something wrong a little bit, and have a wrong interpretation? And they just don't even mess with it. Man, this is the blessed hope of the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, man. This ought to be central in, in preaching, in my view. I know you have a wacky preacher, and he's, he's on board, and he's leading the charge. He's not afraid to teach the book of Daniel. It's so exciting to me. Oh, my goodness. Now, notice verse 27, and he, this is the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many. That many is the Jewish people. That's what this whole chapter is about. He's going to confirm a covenant with the Jewish people. It's interesting. It doesn't say he's going to make a covenant. It says he's going to confirm a covenant, which tells us just by the linguistics that a covenant is already sort of signed Kind of sealed, but not delivered. That was done back under the, um, was it the Clinton administration when uh, Arafat, they got together and they signed the covenant and, you know, for peace between the Palestinians and no more uh, terrorism and we'll we'll live in peace. (laughs) He signed it, they sealed it, but they didn't deliver it. There'll be no peace. Ultimately, till the Prince of Peace comes. But the Antichrist comes in. Revelation 6, the Antichrist rides into the world scene on a white horse of peace, having a bow, but no arrows, conquering, but conquering diplomatically, not militarily yet. But then the second horse of the Apocalypse, chapter 6, he comes in on a red horse of war. Power's getting ready to make war. And so, man, it's just all starting to fit together, isn't it? It thrills my soul. You ought to do sometimes, just read through the book of Daniel in about 15 minutes. Just read it. And you will see it so, when you just read it, or the book of Revelation in like 35 minutes. Just read it. It's like, oh, holy cow. There it is. Sometimes we lose sight of the forest for all the trees. He, so he confirms a covenant with the Jewish people. He's the Western leader, the Westy guy, revived Roman Empire guy. And Israel feels a need to kind of, excuse me, suck up with this guy for some reason. From 48 till today, America has been the one who has backed Israel. We have been their best friend. And not, let me tell you, we ain't their best friend anymore. Not with this administration. And America, well, we're getting into the northeast, south, the east, the west in just a minute. What's happening in Russia and Ukraine, I guess I'll throw it in now because it fits here. It's going to fit again. America's being weakened. America is becoming impotent. I'm going to show you that in Ezekiel 38. It's already begun. We gave one-third of our military to the Taliban. (laughs) Yeah, that'll really make America great again. Amen? You see, Satan is in charge. He's the prince in power. He's running the show. God told us what to look for. What do we see? (laughs) Exactly what God said. And I don't know if my calling is to stop that. My calling is definitely to be aware of it. And proclaim it. 
And I think my victory is bringing people to Jesus who will be ready. So my victory is not in the Republican Party or in a candidate or in, in, in stopping that. It, it, if, if, the, if Jesus comes tonight and the Antichrist arises tomorrow, we're not losers. We're winners. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, you guys didn't stop the Antichrist. You were lousy pastors. <laughs> well, I might be a lousy pastor, but it's not on that issue. It's not my calling. That's in God's hands, not mine. Well, Duke, fix it. Duke, Duke, preacher. Jeremy, fix it, man. He's coming. Stop him. That's not our calling. We, he just told us what he's going to allow Satan to do. I'm no match for Satan, but he's no match for God. It's just amazing to me. So, I see what's happening is America weakening. They need a helper. Now, you've got to remember, this Israel is secular Jews. They're not Messianic Jews. Messianic Jews are gone by this time. They're gone. They went home to heaven with the church. They're part of the church. This, these are secular Jews who don't believe in God. They don't believe... In providence they're scared they're signing on to him not because they love him they're desperate and that's happening with America weakening oh I could do a whole hour right on that point but we're just gonna get through our study tonight and you're gonna like that better amen and in the midst of the week he for the first three and a half years the first thing he seems to do is confirm this covenant with the Jewish people. What's Islam going to think about that? <laughs> they don't even believe in Israel's right to exist. And you're suck and, and he's he's hanging with the Jews? We hate this guy. You see, Easty, Westy, Northy, Southy, every one of them have a um, imperial uh, position. Every one of them have an expansionistic view of what they're doing and why. Russia wants to take over the world. China, what do they want to do? They want to take over the world. What does Islam want to do? They want to take over the world. What does the Antichrist want to do? Take over the world. Well, who's the good guy? None of them. There's good guys in Russia. I, I have brothers and sisters in Christ all across Russia. So do you. All across Iran. There's, I, I've heard there's a million people got saved in Iran in the last three years. I hope that's true. In mass they're turning to Jesus. I turn on my podcast and I go to the screen. And I, you know, one, one, one month I, I had like 175 downloads in Syria. All I can say is God just takes, you put it out there and and somehow he directs them surfing the web and they find Pastor Duke podcast. And they have a hunger in Iran to study exactly the same things you and I are studying tonight. Wow. Boy, God can get the message to them. You know, even if I can't go to Iran, uh, Syria, God can take the message to Syria. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Satan doesn't own the internet. He owns a lot of it. He doesn't control all of it. Blows my mind. So there's good guys all around China, Russia, Ukraine. But it's the governments, all of them expansionistic, Satan inspiring every one of them to do their thing because Satan's goal is to wipe out humanity. If he's going to hell, he knows his days are short. He just wants to use one group against the other. We can see in Revelation 13, he uses the, he uses the false prophet to, to raise up the Antichrist, religion and government. Then he takes the Antichrist and destroys the false prophet. That's exactly the scenario of the book of Revelation. Northy, southy, easty, westy, left behind, Christ has come. He's going to destroy the Antichrist and Satan inspires all the groups. They're going to clash. I'm going to show you the order of it in a minute. And then Jesus at the end. Steps back, on, he mounts his white horse, and he descends. And the armies of God will follow him. My wife doesn't want to ride a white horse in that event. But I hope Jesus makes her. <laughs> Get on behind the Duke Meister. Hold on, sweetheart. 
She said, you know, in heaven we're going to be like the angels and she's not going to be the boyfriend girlfriend thing like it is here. She might be right. I still want her on the back of my white horse, amen. So, the, the, the Antichrist confirms a covenant, looks like the Jewish answer man, white horse of peace, Revelation 6, and then the red horse of war. In the middle of the tribulation, it says, in the midst of the week, last part of verse 27, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Well, the sacrifice and oblation, the Jewish sacrificial system, that ceased in 70 A.D. when the temple went down. I think it's going to resume. Last time I was in Jerusalem, I saw the menorah they have ready to put in the new temple. They're ready to rebuild. It's all really built. It's a prefab thing. They'll have that thing up in 30 days when the time is right. And then the Antichrist goes into that temple, desecrates it, claims to be God. We are almost there, gang. We are almost there. He's going to stop their sacrifice. And that's when the Jews have their wake-up call and realize, oh boy, we blew it. And they, he, they flee. Jesus talked about that, Matthew 24. When you come down from your rooftop, don't stop off to get your iPhone. Just head on out to the wilderness. I took care of you, of, of you guys in the wilderness with Moses. I'm going to take care of you guys in the last days for the last three and a half years of tribulation in the Judean wilderness, probably the city of Petra. That's a whole other sermon. There's so many facets to the end day scenario. But what I want to leave you with tonight, and I need about 15 more minutes, we're just going to put it all together. And then you turn on the news, it's like, don't expect America to be great again, folks. And if I'm wrong, I'm happy. I don't want to be right. I just cheated. I read the scriptures. Don't expect that. You'll be bumming, I think, if you do. I wouldn't expect gas prices to come down. I hope they do. But evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So my joy in the midst of this, God will provide a table in the wilderness for us. He's going to take care of us. And then we just tell people about Jesus. And they see that we're not freaking out. And they see that our faith is real. Then we can show them all this stuff in the scriptures. We watch people come out of the darkness into the light. So, then we have, he's in the, he's in the temple now, stops their sacrifice, begins, he does the abomination, the sacrifice of oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, the ultimate blasphemy. He sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. That's what got him cast out of heaven in Isaiah 14. I will be as God. That's what the lie told Eve in Genesis chapter 3. You shall be as gods. That's, that's his lie. And now listen to uh, Yuval Noah Harari. Do you believe in God? He says, not yet, but I'm going to be soon. That's what he says. He means it. I think I know who he hangs out with. Spiritually. This is crazy. And yet it's our reality. And so we have the abomination of desolations. So that's the Westie. (laughs) Genesis 9 said Japheth will be the one who has the most power. Didn't say he's going to be good. He just said he'll be the one, the dominant one. So I want to look for a moment at Southie, Daniel 11, the South. Now this is a little bit more obscure. This is an interpretation here, okay? But uh, when guys like uh, Dr. David Jeremiah go with it, I have confidence in it. Because we know the blocks are Russia, her allies, we'll be there in just a moment, Ezekiel 38, the West, China, and just so we know that Islam doesn't fit into any of that. Now, Shiite Islam lines up with Russia. The only people Shiites hate <laughs> worse than Israel is each other, the Sunni. Now, they actually all hate Israel, but the Sunnis hook up, the Shiites in Iran hook up with Russia. The Sunnis, which is about 90% of them, they seem to be a caliphate. They seem to be coming together. Not because they love each other, because they have to. You listen to all uh, uh, 
Klaus Schwab's New World Order, 800 foot square foot apartments, high rise buildings, smart cities, no cars, no medical decisions, everything controlled. Islam doesn't fit. <laughs> they have no plans for Islam. They'll starve them out so fast and Islam knows this. And so they're watching. When I think of Zionism, I think that land belongs to the Jewish people. God gave it to Abraham, his descendants. When they think of Zionism, they think of the deep state, the cabal, which has had a lot of secular Jews all the way back to the Rothschilds dynasty. It's been Jewish central, the people that have been controlling and guiding this whole thing economically, and they know that, and they hate the deep state as much as I do but they're more threatened by it than I am. And they don't have a redeemer living in their heart like we do. They're fearful. And when the Antichrist confirms the covenant with the Jewish people, chapter nine, what does Islam think about that? We hate this guy, <coughs> it is time. And they believe in their faith, if they bring jihad, holy war against the forces of they believe is Satan and I, I think it is Satan but I think it's Satan in them too that they'll so please Allah that he'll uh, send the Mahdi from the well that fell into uh, the occult <laughs> uh, uh, many years ago and bring back the Mahdi and that will be Islamic Armageddon and Islam wins control of the world that's their view. That's their eschatology. And they are getting ready. Now, we go to Daniel 11, and we see, uh, I believe, I, I think you'll see this. Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 40. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Egypt is to the south, okay? Egypt historically has been the center of Islamic things. It was Egypt that's kind of led in the 67 war. It was Egypt that was leading the Suez Canal War with Israel. It was Egypt uh, that uh, was the leader in the 67 and the 73 Yom Kippur War. Now there's been a peace between Israel and Egypt since uh, the Camp David Accord, but that peace will certainly be broken. And uh, the land of Egypt shall escape. Now we think northeast, south, east, east, west. This isn't north of Washington <laughs> and south of Washington or north of Beijing or south of, of Moscow. Israel is God's pin drop on the planet. And this is the south, we'll see. And uh, Egypt shall not escape. Verse 43, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. The Libyans, the Ethiopians shall be at his steps uh, and uh, all the massive supplies of that southern kingdom. But tidings out of the east, northeast, southeast, easty, westy, tidings out of the east. This is China. I think that'll be the final battle. I see three battles in the war of Armageddon. The kings of the south first. Because when Antichrist confirms a covenant with the Jewish people, they're ready to move. And they move quickly. I think just within weeks after the signing of that decree, they amass their forces and they fight. Now notice, but tidings out of the east. Uh, China's not happy about the Westy people and what's going on there. Russia's not happy with the Westy power that is arising, NATO and all that's going on there. But tidings out of the east and out of the north, that's the three battles. Kings from the south, uh, Islam. Kings of the north, Russia, Ezekiel 38. We're going to go there in just a moment. And then the tidings from the east, Revelate, uh, uh, China, the, the kings of the east, an army of 200 million, according to Dan Revelation chapter 9, verse 16. And out of the north shall, um, verse 44, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Him, that's the Antichrist. He's going to have uh, some war to fight. Came in on a white horse of peace, now it's a red horse of war. Therefore he shall go forth and great fury to destroy and utterly to make, uh, to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace. This is that temple. 
between the seas, that's between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, in the glorious and holy mountain, that's the Temple Mount. He's going to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. So we have the kings of the south, battle number one, watching this all, hating anything that is good to Israel, and they are destroyed. Are they destroyed by God or are they destroyed by Satan? They're destroyed. <laughs> Is it, and they're destroyed supernaturally. I'm going to show you that so clearly in just a moment. So we have, we have the Western power setting up in Jerusalem, confirms the covenant of the Jewish people. The South can't take it. Islam comes together. They fight. They're wiped out. It's a supernatural Something is happening in this warfare. I want to show you in a moment that it wasn't normal warfare. So we have the battle from the south. Now we're going to go to the battle of the north. Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38. I'm going to take this jacket off. I'm sweating. And, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog. That's, nobody disagrees with that. That's ancient Russia. The land of Magog and the chief prince of Meshech. That's modern-day Moscow. Tubal, modern-day Tubalsk, Russia. And prophesy against them. They'll be opposing God. God will be against them. And say, thus saith the Lord. Now, once you get the time frame here, notice you drop down. In verse 8, just to get the time frame when this battle is going to take place. After many days, Ezekiel 38, 8. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Thou shalt come into the land, Israel, that is brought back from the sword. The Jews came home and is gathered out of many people. 120 group, uh, ethnic, 20 different countries did Jews come from to resettle their land. That prophecy is fulfilled to this day against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste from 70 A.D. until they retook their land in 1948, retook Jerusalem in 1967. But it is brought forth out of the nations. That part has been fulfilled, so it's in the latter days. I think uh, the, south, uh, the kings of the south have been destroyed, and now we're getting into the second wave. I'm going to show you why I see this sequence here. So God will be against Russia, verse 3, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you back. Who's going to stop Russia? God is. And he's got them right where he wants them. Just think that, well, Putin is going to do this and take in Ukraine. What's next? He's going to take the Baltic states of Europe. It's going to be World War III. No, no, no. God's got Putin right where he wants him. Putin, Biden, G, G uh, NATO, they're not in control of this thing. <laughs> Satan's doing his thing under the allowance of God. God told us what to expect. It's here. I'll stop you. I will turn you back and put hooks in your jaws. I will bring thee forth with all thine army. Russia, great military power, was hysterical until the 20th century. They had no military force ever throughout history until this past century. All thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Who will march with them? Persia, now called Iran. When I got saved, 1972, Persia was lined up with America. The Shah was in Iran. Gasoline was 25 cents a gallon. The Shah is deposed. Ayatollah Khomeini, the fundamentalist Islamic revolution takes place. Gasoline prices triple. We had gas lines. Boy, the, boy we had to pay all the way up to 75 cents a gallon. <laughs> <laughs> it was 4.85 in Albany today, so just so you guys are about 25 cents behind us. We always lead the way in corruption. So, <laughs> um, I saw. I saw this fulfilled in 1974, 73, 74, after I got saved. When I read that Persia is going to line up with Russia, wait a minute, Persia is lined up with us. <laughs> I saw that happen. Ethiopia, Haile Selassie died. He was very open to Christian missions. He died. And the Russians kind of came in, the Soviets, and uh, I watched Ethiopia line up with Russia. And Libya. Gaddafi came to power, and in Libya, we used to get a lot of Libyan oil, no more. 
they hooked up with Russia. I saw that happen in the 70s, right after I got saved. I watched that verse happen. So this is the word of God. He said, I gave you the end from the beginning. And all of them with all shield and helmet. Gomer, now separate, Gomer is separate. This is up to interpretation, but Dr. Jeremiah and I think. Gomer's Germany. Germany's part of NATO. How could they be hooking up with Russia? But um, <clears throat> Merkel, Angela Merkel, was from Klaus Schwab's school of young globalists. She's in power. She so hates um, American exceptionalism that she <laughs> signed up Russia uh, with Russia with that, uh, what's the name of that pipeline? And somebody would tell me that pipeline from Russia. I just lost the name of it. That they're getting their energy from Russia. Oh, that's what Ezekiel said 2,600 years ago. And you, NATO's furious with them for doing that. But they did it. And all his bands, the House of Togarma, I think that's Turkey, and the North Quarters, all his bands and many people with thee, be thou prepared and prepare thyself, thou and all thy company, and all assembled unto thee. Be thou guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited latter years against the mountains of Israel. And they come down for a reason. Unwalled villages, verse 11. Uh, in earlier days, the villages were walled. In modern day Israel, all these new settlements all over. They're all over the place. They're unwalled. Ezekiel 38 fulfilled. I was there. I said unwalled. And I looked. Yep, they have no walls. Just a literal interpretation of the word of God. Verse 12, to take a spoil. They have a reason to take a prey. There's riches of the little state of Israel that they have something that Russia wants. And uh, to take a spoil. Um, I think Iran joins them to help wipe out the Antichrist <laughs> and his armies. But you know, for, for thousands of years, people looked at the Dead Sea and saw it as the least valuable piece of real estate on the planet. Turns out, it's the most valuable piece of real estate on the planet. The riches of the material, uh, chemical value of the Dead Sea are incalculable. Maybe that's the spoil they want. I don't know. I've also heard that there's oil uh, been discovered in Israel in that giant rift, you know, 1,200 feet below sea level. Now oil is a liquid, and you know what oil does? It flows to the lowest point, just like water in your sink goes down the drain. And if this is true, and Israel's not going to tell us, they just make the world hate them more, but I've told that they've stricken oil, and if that's true, all that oil of, of Iran and, and Kuwait and uh, all that oil in that region may settle and may wind up being Israeli oil. I don't know. I don't know. But God said, they're going, they have a reason to take a spoil. And uh, now notice, here's where America, kind of the Westy part comes in here, that fits together with exactly what we see. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof. Now if you go back and look at these people in the biblical genealogy. These are not descendants of Ham. These are not descendants of Shem. These are descendants of Japheth. This, this is the West that's watching Russia to the north. Now Russia is kind of genetically, they're pretty close. They're descendants of uh, Japheth as well. Isn't that interesting? But these are clear descendants of Japheth who say, shall say unto, unto Russia, unto thee, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, and take away cattle and goods, and take a great spoil? You shouldn't do that. That's not nice. Didn't your mother teach you to mind your own business? They're opposed to it. But there's no power in their complaint. There's no backing it up with military capability. And Russia spurns them. Isn't that exactly what's happening as we speak? Yeah. Russia is spurning NATO. They're spurning the United States. They're spurning Joe Biden. That doesn't surprise me a bit. Now, Tarshish. Some scholars think it's Spain. 
and the young lions thereof would be all the Spanish-speaking Latino countries of the world. Scholars that I follow say it's I England. If, if Tarsus is England, it, we know that Tarsus is an island nation from other scriptures. Spain is not an island. Tarsus, England, is an island nation. I've always believed that Tarsus is England. And if Tarsus is England, the young lions thereof would be us. Canada, half, three quarters of Canada, us, Australia, New Zealand. We're the young lions of Tarsus. So, so what we see here in America is pretty vague. We're not a major player here. But uh, they're opposed to what Russia's doing, but they don't even lift so much as a finger to help. Militarily. They might send money. But it's all lined up. Russia's great military power, Israel's home, unwalled villages, Russia's great power, Iran, with Iran Ethiopia, Libya, Germany. And it's interesting how it's kind of set apart. You have the three together in verse 5, verse 6, Gomer, kind of set apart. Because Gomer just hooked up with Russia about three, four years ago under the Trump administration. And they signed on with the Russian pipeline. We're going to pull this all together now in closing. Again in verse 16, Now it shall come up against thy people in the latter days. And if you finish reading 38, 39, you'll see what happens. God shows up, kicks our butt, wipes them out, and the world is watching. Go to Revelation 13, and I want to develop that word watching for a minute, and we'll be just about finished for tonight. Revelation 13, we have the rise of the Antichrist. I'm just going to hit this quick and run. Now, the Antichrist is going to claim to be who? God. For somebody to claim to be God, they've got to have some credentials. I'm going to show you his credentials right now. Just quote it for time's sake. In 2 Thessalonians 2, it says, um, With all deceivableness of unrighteous in them that perish, because they receive not the love, they shall believe a lie. The Antichrist will have a lie. The mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth, holdeth back, restraineth, will let until he, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us believers, be taken out of his way. Then shall that wicked one be revealed. Where does the Holy Spirit live? In us. When are we taken out of his way? Rapture of the church. Then shall the wicked be revealed. Who do you think the Antichrist is? Don't matter to me because he can't come till I go. Amen. Um, so, those that are left behind are lied to by the Antichrist. What is a lie? The opposite of the truth. What is the truth of the rapture? The mercy of God. He comes to deliver his people. What would the opposite of that be? The wrath of God came upon the children of disobedience. What do they call us now in their worldview? Deplorable. Unredeemable. That's how they see us. And when we're gone, they're glad. Thank God I didn't go to Bible Baptist. I knew those people were weird. God just wiped them out. So I see a tripod for the Antichrist to arise. Leg number one, the lie. He comes on international TV, speak to every nation, kindred and trung. You know how they do that electronically. You see that on Facebook. I have friends in all over the world. I can't speak their language. I send them messages all the time. It just translates. He speaks to the world. The world's never faced. And he'll be articulate. He'll probably be handsome. He'll have an, uh, an aura of, of power of Satan himself, the angel of light. And the world will be comforted by his explanation of the rapture. You can't pretend the rapture didn't happen. It's a visitation of God to the planet. He just, just twisted to the opposite. And God has visited the planet and those that have chosen not to be a part and be good global citizens who thought Jesus is the only way. Homophobes, xenophobes, God just had it up to here with them and he wiped them out. Some people think it's going to be a, a hale bob comet and Spaceships come and take us away. I don't know. I don't, I don't buy. I don't see that in Scripture. I see a lie in Scripture. And then that was in Revelation 13. We'll wrap this up tonight. 
And we see the rise of the Antichrist in Revelation 13, 1 and 2. And it says in verse 3, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. I don't think it's two-headed. I think head number one would represent politics and money. Head number two would represent spirituality or religion. His head is wounded, his deadly wound is healed. All the world wondered after the beast. Leg number one of power, the lie, tells the world exactly what they want to hear. Number two, the wound is healed. It looks like he's dead. And then it looks like he's alive and well. I don't think Satan has the power to actually do that, but it looks that way. Through, you know, they can make anything look like anything today with technology. But the world's watching. That's, how can the world watch this without technology? You see, you have to have the technology for this to be the the time of the end. And it's here. The result, they're watching, and they say, um, all the world wondered after the beast. Like, he says he's God. Hey, I think Jesus is God because of the resurrection. They're going to think the same thing. Only thing is, Jesus really did rise. (laughs) That big difference. Verse 4, and they worshipped the dragon, that's Satan, and gave power unto the beast, the Antichrist, and they worshiped the beast. Now listen to what they say, and I think this, for me, this pulls it all together. I, I hope it does for you too. Who's like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Who's able to make war with him? Why would they say that? I think I know. They watched the kings of the south get wiped, stinking out. But the rest of the world didn't really care when Islam got wiped out. They've been in a thorn in the side of the world ever since Muhammad and, uh, and uh, his false teachings. And they watch it, but they see that happen. He's fighting against Israel. Who's defending Israel? The Antichrist. They saw that happen. And, and, and Russia comes down with Iran. They're all lined up. That's all in place. They haven't come down against the mountains of Israel. They're coming to take eastern Ukraine to get rid of the neo-Nazis and get rid of the bio labs that, la- uh, labs that were threatening them. A missionary friend of mine from Russia came back. I met with her last week. She's from my home church. She's been in Russia 35 years. She said everything on the U.S. media about Russia is false. Interesting, isn't it? Are they good guys? No. But Ukraines aren't good guys. Now, there's a lot of good people that are suffering, and that breaks my heart. <coughs> But the governments are corrupt. America is bad. America is up to here in corruption. The CIA and what we've done, oh my goodness. And they hide it from the American populace. The evil is everywhere. Now notice they say, who's able to make war with him? (laughs) They see Russia come down with these allies. They see Russia supernaturally destroyed. God said, I will stop Russia. And he does. Who's defending Israel? The Antichrist. What happens to Islam when they come against Israel? Wiped out. What happens against Russia when they come against Israel? Wiped out. And they say, who's able to make war with him? He he says he's God. I'm going to follow him. I'll I'll, I'll take the mark. I'll I'll take the mark. See how it all fits? One last Um, hit the Westie, doesn't get so much attention. So we have Battle 1, Southie, Islam. Battle 2, Russia, Northie. Battle 3, the final battle, um, Eastie, Revelation 9, 16. We see the number of their valley. Revelation is not always... uh, Chronological. I think this is one of the non-chronological moments of <coughs> a revelation. It gives it, uh, <coughs> the Holy Spirit tells John about this vast army that's going to march against Israel. Revelation 9, 16. The number of the army uh, of horsemen were 200,000, 200 million, and I heard the number of them. Then if you go to Revelation 16, 12, Revelation 16, 12. 
And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, which stands between China and the uh, valley of Megiddo, or the plains of Megiddo in Israel, where the final battle will be fought of Armageddon and the Euphrates. And the water there was dried up that the kings of the east might be prepared. And we have the final battle we call Armageddon. I think all three of them are part of the campaign of Armageddon. The Antichrist rides in diplomatically on a white horse of peace, then the red horse of war signs the covenant with the, confirms the covenant with the Jewish people. Islam freaks out. They fight, they're destroyed. The world is watching. Russia, it's, it's now or never. <laughs> it's, it's time. They come down against Israel, the mountains of Israel. But who are they really coming after? I think they're coming after the Antichrist. He's got all the riches of the Dead Sea. Now we can't afford this. We, we take him out now or we'll be destroyed. And of course, God destroys them. He destroys Islam because they're evil. He destroys the North Russia because they're evil. He's going to destroy Russia because they're evil. And then our king, the ancient of days, the rock of our salvation. The father says, it's time. And the church and the redeemed of heaven, the armies of heaven, are mounted and he descends. Just like Ezekiel, the horses and chariots of fire, Jesus comes in and wipes them out by the sword of his word and it prevails. Amen. And then his kingdom will come. Yeah. And his will. His will. No more locks on our doors. Amen. Yeah. The lion will lie down with the lamb peace. John Lennon saying, imagine all the world living in peace. But he also said, imagine there's no religion. He said we're more popular than Jesus. I love John. I, sh I, sh I didn't know Jesus yet, but I knew John crossed the line. Dude, you shouldn't say that. Which was the beetle that died violently, premature death. John, I think he reaped what he sowed. Wow. It's almost here, folks. It's all set. I, I might be off on some of my interpretations, but I'm, I know I'm not off on who wins. <laughs> it's not ever been in question. And he's chosen to lay all this out take the glove of prophecy, which we've looked at a bunch tonight. I hope I didn't overwhelm you. But it all fits. And here we are in Marysville, Ohio. What a wonderful place to be. A difficult, but what a wonderful time. I'd rather, I'd rather have a hole in the sky than a hole in the ground. Amen? I'd rather be raptured than lay in a hospital bed and, you know, cancer and get skinnier and skinnier and have everybody go around crying and, you know, I want a quick, clean kill. <laughs> or even better yet, a quick, clean rapture and twinkle of an eye. Gone! So what do we have to worry about? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we have anything to worry about. Except between us and God. That's, he's telling us all this so that we're right with him. Are, are we right with God? Are we holding on to sins? Are we, are we kind of doing stuff behind the scenes? And that, that's, that's the problem. But Putin, Jesus isn't freaking out. Oh no, Putin's scaring me, man. <laughs> no. God sits in heaven and laughs. He says, Psalm 2, why do the heathen rage? What, are they stupid? <laughs> they can't win. And the people imagine a vain thing. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. And he sent his son to redeem us, to pay for our sin, the Lamb of God. And he's coming as a lion. They wanted the, they wanted the lion and rejected the lamb. And now they want the, lo the lamb. Oh, just make us feel good. 
and they're going to get the lion. And they're not ready. And the only hope they have of being ready is what, preacher? It's us. We are their only hope. The enemy's already made them think we're deplorable and unredeemable and homophobes and xenophobes and all the stuff they call us. I'm a domestic terrorist in New York because I'm unvaxxed. They got FEMA camps ready for me. They, they can't get the legislation to make it through law. They're going to do it through the Department of Health. It's almost there. You say, why are you moving to South Carolina? Because I don't want to go to a FEMA camp. But if, if I am taken there against my will, they, if I rob a bank, it's catch and release. I'm for real. But if I'm unvaxxed, no uh, uh, warrant for my arrest. They just come and take me away. So that's how evil some of the state governments are. I don't know if it's California or New York's the worst. I feel almost like I don't want to flee. I'm not scared. I, I, I love doing jail ministry. <laughs> this guy's amazing in the jail. I got to go with him. I was just stealing ideas from him everywhere. Aren't you glad you know what's going on? And the only thing we really do have to worry about is staying close to Jesus. And just being, I think, the thing I can do to drive the devil really crazy is just to be a really nice guy. <laughs> Peter said, love one another fervently. Just fervent love. I feel that in this church. Fervently love one another. Because when people come in from out there, there's no fervent love out there, the gang. It's every man for himself. And they are so in despair. They're on drugs. They're on booze. They're on painkillers. Uh, suicide is just off the charts. They're lonely. They don't know the love of Christ like we know. So we owe them a debt. Paul said, I'm a debtor. We owe them the debt of a close walk with, with God to be that peculiar people. And they accuse us of, you know, all these things. But, but for which of our works do they condemn us? All your hours in the jail, do they condemn you for that? All the benevolent things you guys constantly do, passing out your sticks and telling people about Jesus? I'm stealing that idea. I'm a, th I'm a spiritual thief. <laughs> Nothing new under the sun, bro. Let's pray. Heads are bowed. Thanks for coming tonight. What are you going to do about it? I'd, I'd ask you to vow to continue to learn. Would you do that tonight? Oh, would you say a prayer? Oh God, I vow to you. That vow's serious. Vow, don't, don't vow. If, maybe just promise. The vow might be too strong. Would you promise, God, I, I'm going to set myself to be a real ardent student of your word and Bible prophecy. That will please him. Would you say tonight, Lord, I just want to be pure. I want my body to be pure. I want my mind to be pure. That would please the Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments. Purity will keep you out of a lot of trouble, too. It'll bring favor to you instead of curse. Would you resolve tonight, Lord, I want to be a real strong support to my church. Find my gifts and use them. There's so much work to do in a church, just setting things up and cleaning it and running it and mowing it and fixing it. And you got a million things that needs to be done around here every week. Just jump in a little. Just build your life around the church. Don't fit the church into your life. Let the church be your life. I raised my kids that way. My grandkids are being that raised that way. There, there's no better way to live than church-centric. Would you, would you surrender to that, Lord? I want to go deeper. Would you uh, say, Lord, I'm choosing tonight to forgive those that have sinned against me. Don't let the root of bitterness hold on to you. He's coming. You don't want him to catch you all mad and upset and over some, some thing someone who doesn't love God did to you. He turned you. Just get your eyes off that and on your eyes on Jesus. And just... Uh, Say, Lord, I want to worship you uh, harder, deeper, with more understanding. 
I want my heart to be full of praise. I know what's happening, and I want to be ready for the rapture, and I want to help others be ready. So tonight, is there anybody here who say, Pastor Dick, I'm not 